And thank you, Jesus, for being here. And he knows how fragile we are. He knows exactly how to speak to us, to breathe life into us. But we're fragile people. We're made in his image and likeness, but we're fragile. And he knows it. He could overwhelm us in an instant. So a uh, couple things on the front end. I love Proverbs 8. And I really think uh, Jesus says in uh, Proverbs 8, daily I was his delight before the beginning began, before anything was made. And I really think that was the point of conception for the idea of more relationships in God's family. I think that experience of father and son having delight in fellowship, in relationship, birthed us, okay? Because he's come for new and individual and unique relationships, and that's us. And Jesus, that whole thing spawned out of, I think, just the joy of relationship. And... Uh, Revelation 4.11 in the King James Version, it says, uh, for thy pleasure we are created. For your pleasure. And I was even reminded of that uh, well-known and pretty brilliant film, Chariots of Fire. Did you get to see it? If you haven't, you must. It's such a good film. But in it, they come to Eric Little and they say, why do you run? It was, he's an Olympian. Why do you run? He's a missionary. And he says, when I run, I feel his pleasure. That's enough. When we feel his pleasure, it's motivating. It's inspirational. And it's something we keep running back to. We want more of his pleasure. So as I thought about this this morning, I thought a couple things. One is that we're, we're talking about a journey of our heart. That's the place the Lord speaks and shows up and reveals in our heart. And I thought about how on a journey we could be going along and we look for different signposts to make sure we're going the right way. Because some of us, and I won't tell you exactly who, have got lost. Get lost on a journey. And it's very difficult to admit you're lost when your wife Excuse me, I didn't want to disclose that, is in the car with you. But it, it, you can get lost. And it's nice to see the signposts. And the signposts will say how far away you are or you need to turn. And if the sign doesn't, you're in trouble. And if it's dark and you're in a foreign land and there's no signage, you're in big trouble. So I really feel like the Lord's been giving signs to us during the course of this time. And uh, so I'm asking that the Lord would give you signs even today in your heart that you know he's watching you. He's, know, he's all about you. Okay. So uh, this first one is, says that we are heart-driven people. That's how he speaks to us. That's where we yearn. That's where we desire Wherever we go, the issues of our heart go with us. And, and we really want and desire to be an issue-free people. Now, this is where Jesus sets the bar. Can I have to step out for a minute? I wanted you to read Luke 6 here. This is Jesus setting the bar. And here's the mic. I'm going to turn this down for just a sec. Luke 6, 27 through 35. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also. Whoever takes away your coat, do not withhold your shirt from him either. 
give to everyone who asks of you, and whoever takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great and you will be the sons of the Most High. Yeah, that's uh, quite powerful, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So, when I read this, I'm challenged. I love the idea of all this. Conceptually, I'm there. Practically, it's difficult. But that is how Jesus sets the bar. He puts something in front of us that we find it very difficult to do. And that's part of the process we're going to be talking about today. Things that we must do to really honor Jesus and obey the truth, but are very challenging. Then Jesus says in Luke 6, he says, the good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good, and the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil, for his mouth speaks from which fills his heart. And I think we know this, but what we find difficult is when it, something comes out of our mouth that really reveals something that's not right in us. And we're a little bit surprised. But somehow the Lord puts us in just the right places and the right relationships that things come out that we never planned on coming out. And we said too much or reacted the wrong way or something came out. So all of a sudden, our, our heart begins to expose us, and we're very surprised by that. But the truth is, when we're walking with Jesus, the light is now in us. The light of his spirit is in us. When we come into relationship with Jesus, we're expecting peace. We're expecting lots of grace, lots of kindness, and just almost... an a supernatural way of life. But Jesus knows he has to reclaim the ground of our heart. There's things that are in us that we're not even fully aware of or the implications of what those things do. And when the light comes, and the light always shows up in relationship. And when I say relationship, not just with the Father, but with others, with family members, with spouses, with children, with parents, everything in relationships sort of bubbles to the surface of our heart, that the Lord's light in his kindness shines on. And I will say, he doesn't show us everything at once. He knows what we're able to respond to. So we're in a journey with the Lord, and the process is for him to disclose things to us in his kindness that are troubling us, that are lingering behind. So while we're walking with Jesus, I can get hurt by someone out of nowhere. I feel a disrespect. I feel maybe a sense of rejection or being left out or misjudged. The light of Jesus is shining. And it can come at any time. So, usually we get ambushed by disrespect or ambushed by what I would call an offense. We get offended. We didn't expect it. We're in a place and all of a sudden we get offended. So, I was at a, an institution of higher learning in the U.S. And I was in the graduate program there. 
And while I was going, and I was having a lot of favor, I knew Jesus, I was doing it because I felt the Lord wanted me to do it. I had lots of favor, Caleb was in the same school, and we're, we're having favor, we're getting provision, surprise provision for scholarship. And all of, everything's going fine, and all of a sudden I'm in a class now with a, a professor who, for some reason, didn't like me. And um, that's hard for me to accept. I'm just playing with you. But we expect everyone to just at least tolerate us. But he didn't like me. And he he almost made a point of coming against me. And so when this, I'm getting offended. And I'm in a class. I'm one of several classes. And I'm trying to hang in there emotionally and stay tuned in and do the right thing. But I would turn in my coursework, and he'd return it to me, and he gave me the lowest grades I've had. And he was making these comments about me, and I'm going, what the heck? And so, you know, I'm I'm a reasonable man, so I go to see him after class and talk to him. It doesn't do any good. It doesn't do any good. He, he He sees things a certain way. He sees my work, and he sees... What I'm doing, and he, and he tells me very clearly. So I walk away baffled, not understanding what's going on. But I do know I'm offended. And over the course of this semester, it doesn't get any better. And this, I didn't know at the time, it wasn't clear to me at the time, I should say, that this was on Jesus' watch. I was going through this serious offense and it was sort of ruining my experience. And he even told some other professors about this that had been in my corner, in my camp. And now they're looking at me through different eyes. And I'm, I'm going, what the, what the, what the? Do you know the what the, what the? <laughs> I'm ambushed. I don't know what's going on. I've done something and I don't even know what I've done. But... I am offended. I've tried with this one. And then I've gone to someone who I thought was my advocate, the chairman of the department, and I'm talking to him, and then he says some things back to me that could only have come back from this professor who, for some reason... So the whole thing is just falling apart. At the end of that semester, I make a decision. I'm not going further on. I've just finished a master's degree, and I'm not going into a PhD program because I don't even know if I can get in now where it was assured before. And the whole thing just sort of fell apart. So I don't know what's going on. Why the conflict? Why the conflict? So what tends to happen then, as I took employment a couple years later, as I'm pressing into Jesus, this whole episode comes up. And I, I don't know what to do, but I've, I've, I've walked with the Lord enough that when I get convicted, I have to do something. So I've left out gaps in my life because I didn't want to have time and I just didn't want to get to it yesterday, but I had learned how to repent. I had learned how to own up. I had learned by my bad behavior before I met Jesus to go back to people and tell them that I had done this and I regret it and I'm sorry and I'd like to pay them back for anything I've done to them. So I've, I've done this, so I'm going, oh, come on, this is a few years later after that. So I go back to the professor out of the blue two years later I come into his room because I had worked this over because the light was shining in my heart. And Jesus said, I had not forgiven this professor. Now, I had my list of reasons and excuses, but Jesus wouldn't let me off the hook. He says, you need to reconcile. So I'm going back to a professor that doesn't seem to know who Jesus is. But I'm going to go back and try and reconcile. And the only way I know to do this is to go in low and take the blame. So I go to this professor and I come into him out of the blue and I 
see his secretary, and I go in there, and he's busy doing his thing. And I come in there, and he's looking at me like, what's this all about? And I say to him, pretty much, I say, look, I feel that when I was going to school in your classroom that I really, really disrespected you. I didn't treat you right. I'm making some assumptions here because there wasn't much love between us, okay? And I said, so I really want to come today and just tell you I was wrong. I didn't mean to do that, but I'm sorry I did that, and I ask your forgiveness for doing that. And he looks up and he says to me, I don't know what you're talking about. I, don't, I didn't have any problem. So I don't know what I can do to help you. And I said, well, I just wanted to say that to you and no problem. And, you know, that's fine. And I wish you well. And I walked out of the deal. But I walked out of his office with a clean conscience and a pure heart and a sincere faith. I walked out feeling I'm just honoring the Lord. If, if I get some extra benefit, it's nice, you know. But so that's where I went. So I want to talk to you today about offense. Because the church is getting filled with offense. And marriages are getting filled with offenses. And parenting is filled with offenses. And it's the little thing that grows into a big problem. It's almost like having a stone in your shoe. Every time you make a step, you feel it, but it's a little stone. It's very irritating. It's very annoying. And you, you know right then and there, let's get the stone out, okay? But there's something in a heart that goes like that as well. So another illustration. Uh, first of all, living with an offense inside of us, someone has offended us. We know it, we feel it, we felt the pain. And we walk around with it, we don't understand it, but it's clearly, there's no question about this, it's clearly their fault. I've done nothing. I can't think of one thing I've done. So I'm offended with this person, I'm walking around, and all of a sudden when I see them, I'm not looking at them the same way with the offense. The offense has put a filter up there. And I'm looking at them very suspicious. And how, why? They're supposed to be a believer. They're supposed to have, you know, a relationship with the Lord that helps them walk in the light. So there's this, what I call the loop. And it's in these conversations. And I don't know if some of you are wired the same way I am, but I have so many stinking, to be descriptive, stinking conversations in my head with the person. That's how I vent, okay? I'm having all these conversations in my head. Why would you do that? I don't, you, what were you thinking? What? And I'm having all these conversations and I think I'm trying to have the conversations to figure out why I've been offended or why they did this to me. So there's conversations in there and then there's behavior that comes out of that. When you're offended, you don't want to be around the person. You, you're avoiding them. You're not looking at them. You barely greet them. You keep on moving. When someone's offended, they don't want to be around the person that caused the offense. Okay? So for my case, uh, there was, I'm in a group of leaders and, uh, in church. And one of the leaders, we had agreement on how things were going to go. And one of the things, one of the leaders started doing something different. And I just, we give lots of latitude and freedom, but it was affecting the church body and the church direction and what was being communicated. So after a week or two, I, I went to the person and I said, hey, I want to be on the same page and I know we've had some understanding. And here, it seems like you're communicating this to the church and there's some confusion now because not all of us are on the same page. And I just want to see what we can do to sort of come back into unity and all that. And he says, I, I, don't, I don't see any problem. I, I just don't see the problem. And I, I tried to express it and it just didn't happen. And so I thought, well, now that he knows 
I'm aware of it and others are aware of it. And then a couple of weeks later, two or three weeks later, it's still going on. It's getting a little difficult. So I go back to him. I said, hey, I just want to do the right thing here. I want us to be of the right heart. And, and I think I just want to ask you, this is what you're doing. I gave him some two or three very specific things that come, seems to contradict what this is going on and over here. And he looks at me and he says, I've done nothing wrong. And I thought, whoa, well, okay. So I said, I've done lots of things wrong. <laughs> and I'm just trying to learn with you on this. So if we can both just go to the Lord with it and see if we can come back around because there's... So that was where we left it, but that's where we left it. Nothing else happened. So this went on for a few weeks. This went on for a month or two. I'm frustrated. Every time the person comes in to the room, I'm just feeling, you know, this is awkward. We're not in unity. We, we're not in agreement here. This is just going the wrong direction. And, and it's all because I'm offended. It's all because this person did something to me that I can't even put my finger on. But what I'm not doing is resolving it. So the conversations in my head started coming out loud. Not in the grocery store, I'm not that sick, okay? But when I was doing my private walks in the morning, I would just start talking out loud. And I was going, God, this is crazy. How, how can this happen? What, 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 what do we need to do? And I'm just speaking and I'm really also telling my hurt. My hurt has to come out in an offense. And finally I said, God, I feel so ripped off. And that's when Jesus, I told you, that's when Jesus said, I know that feeling. And soon as Jesus spoke to my pain, to my alienation in this relationship, to my frustration, it was like, it's over. Jesus spoke, I know that. I'm with you, I'm walking it through you, I got it covered, I'm in control, I'm Lord, okay? And by the way, you're gonna go through everything I've been through, <laughs> okay? So my point is the offense will take us out. The offense has really, it, it's in every relationship, every. So Carolyn and I have been married, what, 30 years? I know, I'm just playing, just playing. It's 43 going on 44. Okay, next month. So we love Jesus. And we have disagreements. She does not have the same personality, the hard wire, and all the beautiful stuff I do. <laughs> That's called provoking. But anyway, so we have our disagreements. And our disagreements are, oh, I love you, but I disagree. It's not like that, okay? It gets, it catches, it's always an ambush, am I right? Why did you do this? What, 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 what? You know, it's, it's always, an amb I either ambush her or she ambushes me. That's what offense looks like. It's not something we expect. Oh, you're so wonderful. I, I just have a question for you. It's not that way, okay? <laughs> so we have these offenses that the enemy is using to destroy relationship, destroy marriages, destroy parenting, destroy church. The offenses are between us. And the way an offense works is very simple. It's your fault. And she thinks, it's my fault. Impossible, okay? That's how it works. It's always the other person. It's the blame game. Am I right? Yeah. And when we walk and we get offended, it's like, I can't believe what they did. Did you see that? Did you see what they said? Did you hear that today at the dinner table? That's incredible, you know? So offense that we take, we blame the other person. We never, ever, ever think it's us. This is where the heart is in the small things that we get hurt about. 
And then what generally happens with an offense, we, we know if we talk about it, we're not very good at defending ourselves, etc. so we just hold it. Then the next offense, and then we have a filter, the next one comes. This is, I can't believe this. So when it gets bad, we start gossiping. If we start talking about our wife to someone else, we're out of bounds, okay? And if we start talking to the church about what the pastor said or the deacon said or especially the worship leader, what he did or what he wore, let's go with that, what he wore, (laughs) then we start ruining their reputation. Am I right? We, We speak it so easily and freely because we think it's evident to everyone, but we are the ones with the offended heart that we're not dealing with that we're not dealing with. Okay. Shoot. You know, if you turn this upside down, it goes backwards. (laughs) Stupid thing. Okay. So what happens in offended territory? In conflict with someone, we get in this territory and all we do is make reasons and excuses why we're right and I can't believe them. They're a believer? Good Lord. Does anyone know? You know? So we have this game, and the other person's doing the same thing. It's called offended territory, okay? And it's conflict now. We, we always use the word conflict, by the way. Conflict sounds better than I'm offended. They go, what's your problem? I'm, I'm not, I'm not, it's a conflict, okay? So the conflict always finds out who's at fault. And Kayla and I have had... Con- a, misunderstanding, not a conflict. And so what we tend to do is explain, I will explain to her why I did it. And then she can barely wait for me to finish before she explains to me why she did hers. And then I feel like she didn't hear me. I need to lift my voice higher. (laughs) Am I right? and explain it to her so she will get it. And she's thinking, is he deaf? And then she goes up, and we're doing this thing. Am I right? You guys, this is one-on-one relationship. We just keep saying, that's called the loop. We keep just changing our voice, use a different phrase, give some examples, pull from the past, building a case for litigation here, you know, to prove, to prove, On Jesus' watch, who's at fault? That's what it's all about. And we're waiting for that person. This is what offense is all about. I'm just waiting for them to hear the Lord. I've tried. Now, if they only heard the Lord, they'll come back and they'll crawl in here on their knees and they'll say, I was so wrong, your majesty. We're waiting for people to admit that they're wrong. That's offended territory. And the church is shriveling up with love. It's shriveling. And marriages are shrinking because we've, we're almost on this loop. It's the same old thing. She never gets me. We go to my room and get the remote and turn it upside down and play with it, you know? So this is what offense does. It alienates us from one another, and it alienates us from Jesus. So Jesus has the way. The only way we can do offense properly, and I want you to know, offense happens every day. You're sitting there and boom, you you didn't even see it, you didn't even hear it, but you walk away from that person and you go, what was that? There's something was thrown at me or something. And by the time you reflect on it, you wonder, did they just, imply that and so our heart is supposed to be radiant with life the vessel and the place for truth to come through for sensitivity to the Holy Spirit and the enemy is making us easily offended with one another so we don't want to be the easily offended ones okay 
So here's how we get out of an offense. An offense comes then, Jesus says, through Paul in Hebrews, uh, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one spirit and of one mind, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Okay? Another translation says, um, take upon you a, a mind of humility, an attitude of humility. So there is no other way that we can be reconciled. There's none. Now, we can state our case and go off and have distance between us. That's what most people choose. But there's no way unless someone initiates. Someone goes in love. That's the only way for reconciliation. There, there, that is the Jesus way, going in love. And we have heard the scriptures all the way through about hum, humility and the power of humility. Okay? So if I am willing to go in low, I can, I can rescue any relationship. I really can. And if it's an unbeliever and doesn't get me like the professor was, it's okay. I did it to the Lord. It's up to the Lord to bring revelation, not my action, not my words. It's the Lord. We honor the Lord with our choices. We honor the Lord by following the way of Jesus. When Jesus says, follow me, he said, this is a great invitation. Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30 says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, you're worn out, and learn of me. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Learn of me. He says, for I am gentle and I am humble. So if we're going to be discipled by Jesus, Two qualities are going to get into our nature, and it's gentleness and humility. And those are counter to the world's dynamics. So we're going to learn how to be gentle with one another, and we're also going to learn how to esteem them better than ourselves. That's part of it. Preferring someone. Jesus stops at the woman at the well. He stops for the demoniac. Jesus stops for all these people that everyone has given up on so he can restore them, so he can empower them, so he can give them vision for real life. So that's what we are. We are Jesus people doing the Jesus way. And reconciliation, guys, I know, I know, T. C, I, L, F, N, O, C. I've been in so much conflict, I can spell it backwards. You can trust me, okay? I know conflict. So there's no other way. Conflict is everybody's right in their own eyes, or someone is going to take initiative and do it to Jesus. Jesus, he says, make my joy complete. The joy of the Lord is unity in a marriage, unity in a family, unity in a church, the joy of the Lord. And it's offenses that get blown up into all kinds of messes. And it started with an offense. So for me, for Kalen and I, what I've learned to do, as I said, I go to Kalen as quickly as I can. Because there's no point in waiting. In the old days, you thought, if you wait, she'll break down and come crawling back. Right? She never did. <laughs> no one's crawling back. Jesus is alive. He's in us. He, we cannot have healthy marriage without Jesus. We would be a mess. We would be a mess without Jesus. He forgives us. 
He gives us grace. He gives us wisdom. He gives us strategies. He gives us understanding. He gives us peace. But without Jesus, you can't have a healthy marriage. There's no way. If Karen and I are doing any marriage counseling, people come to us. If they aren't willing to listen and follow Jesus, I got nothing. I got nothing. You can't, oh, go be good, be nice, maybe go out to dinner once a week. What do you got for them? It's Jesus. Jesus changes us and Jesus gives us hope. And Jesus fills us with love for one another. It's supernatural. We cannot have marriage with natural desires. It will not work. Natural desires will tear each other up because self is on the throne. With Jesus, self is coming down. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross, deny yourself, and come follow me. And then we're going to find life. We're going to find meaning. We're going to find joy. We're going to find wisdom. We're going to find power. So with Kalen, I have to come back and say, Kalen, I am sorry for the way I talked to you. It was wrong. I don't want to be that guy. Will you forgive me? That's how we do it. Offense is gone. She says, absolutely. She knows. Because between you and I, she's a sinner saved by grace. Okay, so am I. We're going to fall down. We're going to make mistakes. We can't be so proud. We hold on to our offense and wait for this one to come to me. And Jesus says, the first shall be last. The last will be first. He's looking for those that have courage to be humble. It takes courage. Because you might be misunderstood. It takes courage. It also takes focus on Jesus. Jesus, the only reason I'm doing this, because of you. I've been really hurt, but I know you are changing my heart. So I'm, I'm giving you some examples here. I've had people, I had someone, I was speaking at a church and I came out and I knew this person and I walked out and and afterwards, he pulled me aside and said, you know, you really, really hurt my feelings. And I said, really? I said, I, I didn't want to hurt your feelings. What did I do? That, I'm sorry, what did I do to hurt your feelings? He said, you walked off the stage, you walked right by me, and you didn't say hello. I said, what a cursed person I am. No, I never said that. <laughs> but I said, look, what? I don't want that to be between us. I don't, I don't want to offend you. I respect you. You're a friend. You know, I, I ask your forgiveness. It's okay to go in low. It's a safe place. You change the dynamics of a family. You change the dynamics of a team by doing it the Jesus way. You change the dynamics of a church. Okay, here. How am I doing in time? Good Lord. Okay. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Just a few verses beyond this. The same mindset or the same attitude of Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, delighting in the Father, did not consider equality with the Father something to be used in his own advantage. Do you know who I am? Do you know, uh, the Bible says, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. I'm not even going to say it. You know what I'm talking about. It's nonsense, okay? We don't lift ourselves up. We don't puff ourselves up. There's no life in it. It's anti-Jesus. Self is going down. Self needs to go down. That's where grace abides. That's where Revelation happens. Revelation happens in obeying Jesus, following Jesus. And then it says here, rather he made himself nothing. Jesus chose to come in the most unlikely manner ever imagined for our creator. He came unto his own and his own did not receive him. To those that did, he gave them the right to be sons of God. 
So all of this, what we're sharing, is God is trying to put his nature in us. His nature in us. So he does it by taking us into places where we need him. We don't coast through life, no problems, no issues. It's so easy around here. We're running into issues every day. We're running into troubles every day. We're running into frustrations every day. So here's the wrestling match, WWF. I wanted to speak your language. Okay. Spirit man and self. Jesus wants us mighty in spirit. We're to be mighty, led by his spirit. We're supposed to be speaking the words of God. We are the blessers. We are the salt and we are the light. We are the influencers. But we don't come in on a white horse. We come in on a donkey. Or we come walking 10, 15, 20 kilometers to a village. That's how we do it. We come in low. But what we do, we carry the power of a transformed life. And we are carriers of this power. But we don't come in looking for attention or special privileges or I have this position, I've got this posting. If you should see my CV right now, it's not going to happen. Jesus' way is the way that comes in to serve, to love, to be a safe place. Most people are insecure. Even the ones that are successful, they're insecure. And most people are troubled by their ineffectiveness. So we all are broken. They're looking for a safe one. The one that goes in low is the one that's a safe one. The one that comes in with all the answers, sure. You don't feel safe. You can't tell them where you're at. So the Jesus way. Okay. I'm taking a, a turn here. So Jesus is after us running for help to him. So when the light of the Holy Spirit is upon us and he's dwelling in us, he is the spirit of truth. And Jesus shows us the ugliness and bad behavior. And the Father cannot force us to change. He could. He, that's not in his nature. He could. It's not in his nature. He's looking at people that want to choose freely. Choose out of desire. That's the kind of respect and honor empowerment that Jesus gives to all of his creation. We choose freely. We can be intimidated into choices. He doesn't do it that way. Now, I must see the need for change, then I choose help. So as long as everything is coasting in my relationships, wow, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. Thank. But when something comes up, uh-oh, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I, and that's a good place. When I don't know what to do with this problem in my life, with this individual that's giving me anxiety or whatever it is, Jesus, would you help me? I need your help. Give me some wisdom, Lord. I press into you. Show me what to do. He will always say, go and low. He'll give you words. He'll give you ideas. He'll give you suggestions. But you have to go in preferring them, seeing them whether they're a demoniac or a beggar, lifting them up. Lifting them up so they feel some dignity because they've lacked dignity most of their lives. And the church is going out there to restore people in the image and likeness of God. But no one's ever done. We don't talk down to people. We don't scold them. We don't convince them with argument. We don't beat him up with the scripture. That's not the church. Jesus says what Calen read there and Luke said, 
This is how we love. We love people that don't deserve it. Because Jesus loved us when we never deserved it. So we're learning the Jesus way. Okay. Now here's the other piece. I must see the need for change. Then I choose his help. So there's a scripture in 2 Corinthians 7, 10. It says, godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. So we see this scripture, and I'm thinking about this. Godly sorrow is not like worldly sorrow. Worldly sorrow just brings despair. Worldly sorrow is a dead end. It's hopelessness. And, and as believers, we're probably going to run into quite a number of people that are somewhat hopeless because they don't have the hope of Jesus, hope of change, transformation. But it says, godly sorrow brings repentance. So godly sorrow is least... Now, repentance is the gift of life, by the way. We don't get into the kingdom of Jesus without repentance. And repentance means to own up. My bad behavior is ruining my life and people around me. It's my bad. I can't blame it on other people. If I become the victim, I'll never get saved. I have to own up. I have to say, this is my life. I made some mistakes. I made some bad choices. I repent. I do not want to do that anymore. I'm turning my life around because of Jesus. He's my hope, okay? Now here's the thing, repentance opens the door to the kingdom. Repentance is a glorious thing. Repentance is a gift. When someone's repenting, it's jumping, I probably shouldn't use that phrase anymore, you know, jumping on the stage thing. Yeah. But it's a, it's a shouting experience, okay. Repentance is great. Now, but listen to this. The way you get to repentance is you don't get to repentance like we think we could. Everything's going so good. I think I'm just going to go repent. I'm having a great time. Life is good. I'm going to go repent. The way it works is godly sorrow. I'm really hurting in this relationship. I've really hurt this person. The lights come on. The Holy Spirit turns the lights on. I've really done some bad things here. Or I've mistreated this person. Or I've caused these kind of problems. It's that kind of sorrow that can move us to Jesus. So for someone to get converted, they have to go through a pathway of sorrow. They have to see their own shortcomings, their own moral failures their own damaging behavior with others, that will lead them to repentance, which is a good thing. It's the process of change. So the Lord is after us to go through repentance, and then we come up with a clean heart. A clean heart. Once we repent and get all reconciled with the Father, and then we make sure we're reconciled with those that we've offended, and I'll get to that, that have offended us, we release forgiveness on them. We release forgiveness on them. Okay? So, uh, here's a great scripture, right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar, and go first, Jesus says, be reconciled to your brother, then can present your offering. If you're there worshiping and you think someone has something against you, stop. Reconciliation is more important. Love and unity. Don't come worship me without the love, without the unity in place. This is what makes worship powerful. Worship without that is not powerful, okay? Now, what's interesting right here, this is very important. As you're going, Jesus says, if you think, he's not saying if you're offended, that's an automatic. 
to go worship the Lord with offense toward people and maybe gossiping and all the stuff? No, that's an automatic. So he's not saying if you come up there and you feel offended or you're struggling with unforgiveness, he says, if you think someone has something against you, stop and go to them. And I've done this. Remember, I can spell it backwards. I've gone to people that I felt there was something between us. You'll love this. I go up to them and I say, you know, I don't feel our relationship is in a very healthy spot. And I'm thinking I may have done something to offend you or cause a problem. And I know what they're going to say. You haven't done a thing. They always say, yes, you have. I don't even know it. And I'm offending people. So I'm putting you on alert, guys. We think we're blameless. And if there's something going on between you, the Jesus way is to go to them and say, oh, I'm just feeling we're not in a good place and I I think I may have done something. I'm I'm gonna take the initiative. I'm gonna own this. But I think I may have done something and have I, have I done something to trouble you? You'd be surprised if they say, yeah. Do you remember the other night? Now, once they say it, you're on your way. You've owned it. You've taken the initiative. And you are reconciling the body of Christ for the head. So you say, ah, tell me more about what I did. And they tell you, then you don't, this is the wrong thing. You don't justify it. Well, the reason I did that is because you did that earlier. That's a killer. You say, I am sorry. I don't want to do that to you. And I'm so sorry that's what you felt. And I'm going to ask your forgiveness. I don't want to ever do that to you again. You take the sin away from their heart. You've demonstrated initiative. You've taken humility and courage. And you've reconciled the body of Christ. Do you see, the, do you see what's going on to the fabric of relationship? So this is the way to relationship health. There's some other pieces about forgiveness Kenan's going to talk about. But offense is a major problem. So who are we becoming? It says in the Beatitudes, blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. So I just want to highlight that the Lord's intention is for his nature to get into ours. That's what this is all about. We're in a relational universe. We're surrounded all the time. So as we learn as true disciples, and learning means doing, not just conceptually getting it, but doing it, as we start to do these things, he grows us. He expands our territory. He gives us more stuff to share with others because he's raising us up to be mighty in the spirit. And that means influence others. And often, very often, we influence others by going in low. We have to be a safe place or people are insecure, are defensive, are untrusting because they've been hurt. So we have to go in low for that. Okay. So recognizing that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are in my life means there are no accidents. We've covered that yesterday. There's no accidents. Jesus is there. He's watching. He's seeing. So this means that everything that happens to us is strategic by him. He's absolute, what we talked about. He's absolute in his strategy. He's brilliant beyond our conception. So when all of a sudden I'm in a thing and it's just, like I said, it feels like an ambush, Jesus is saying, I'm coming after you. We're getting your heart right. So if I miss that test with my pride or my ego 
or myself trying to win the day with a good argument or a defense of something, it's not going away. It's coming right at me next, okay? The Lord is after our hearts to be a dwelling place for his nature, for the church to collect and gather together, be the dwelling place. It'd be a place that people feel safe and not threatened, not scolded, not put down, not inferior. It's a safe place because we're all broken and the Holy Spirit's showing us in, in degrees and at times our brokenness so we can be responsive to get it out of us. Okay? Um, and then the last thing here. This is a, a beautiful uh, description. Philippians 50, I'm sorry, uh, Psalms 51. This is David. And David says, this is, this is such a perfect prayer for repentance. This is right after he was uh, apparently convicted about Bathsheba and her uh, husband. David says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. My sin, I can't escape it. Against you and you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So Jesus, I'm sorry, David owns up. He steps up and he says, God, I did it right in front of you. I did this to you. Now, we've got some real serious collateral damage going on with his sin. But he sees the focus. He zooms in and says, God, I'm irresponsible. I was wrong. I had a wicked heart. And I need your cleansing. And then he goes on to say, and against you, you and I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. And then he says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit with me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore, restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. These, this should maybe something we use as a template to just reflect on the Lord when we're feeling, struggling with something. And then he goes on. Then, after all of this, when I'm in right relationship with you, with a clean heart and a clear conscience and a sincere faith, when I have all those things going for me, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. Is that powerful? Okay. So right now, um, right now, you're looking at me. Um, what I'd like to do is I really do feel as we're sharing, we talked about signposts at the very beginning. I really do think as we share even about offense and relationship, that the Holy Spirit is in each one of you. So this is no coincidence or anything. And there are probably some faces in your mind or hurts in your heart or something's being magnified. So before you just go out to tea, you just might want to take two or three or four minutes. And I think the Holy Spirit's going to highlight some people because we are doers of his word and not hearers only. It says, doers of his word and not hearers only. And it says, deceiving ourselves. So sitting and hearing is not enough, not close. So if the Lord has highlighted a family member, a relationship, a friendship, a church member, a colleague at work, it'd be very good of you just to write that down. You don't want to forget what, what the Lord is highlighting and pointing. It says in the word that uh, today, if you hear his voice, do not Harden your heart. Write it down. Don't let it slip. So if there's any relationships that are troubling you or difficult, Kaylin's going to talk some more about that in the next session, so we don't want to let those escape. Okay? Great? Thank you. And then we'll have a break for 30 minutes. Okay. So, Father, we look to you to really highlight 
your truth in our hearts once again. You, you are amazing. You are perfect in all your ways. And Lord, you know each one of our hearts intimately. And, and Lord, people are already feeling your stirring and moving and highlighting things since yesterday as well. So Lord, we ask that you would just uh, become more and more clear and give more and more uh, words to what's in the heart for each one of them, Lord, and lead us and guide us into full repentance, if that be the case, full forgiveness, if that be the case, full reconciliation in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.